Hi everybody, Danny with Benton Homestead here, and I'm filming again today from our small business office here in Japan. Today I'd like to talk to you about Benton Guest House. I thought we could take a general overview look at the process of purchasing our Akia abandoned house, restoring it to a livable condition, and then listing it on Airbnb. Now that Benton Guest House is open and we've been welcoming guests for a few months, this seems like a perfect time to reflect back on this process. And I have to say, even though I lived through this experience myself, it's still sort of hard to believe that we managed to pull it all off in the six month time frame of the startup visa. But we did it. We're open and we can look back and say, this is how we did it. We really did pour our heart and soul into transforming this Akia from a state of abandonment for 10 years into our cute little guest house on Omishima Island. For this installment, I don't intend to go into great detail of the real estate process or the Minpaku rental license process, as those will soon be their own full blog posts. Today, I'd like to give a general overview of the whole process, our specific timeline, our exact budget, and how long we estimate it will take to recoup our expenses. The numbers might surprise you. All right, let's pop on over to the Benton Homestead blog. We're gonna click on Photo Journal and scroll down to the latest post, which is Japan Data, Akia to Airbnb, General Process and Total Expense. As we go through today's video, remember, if you are a person who prefers to read your content, you're welcome to just hop over to bentonhomestead.com and read the blog yourself, which has all the information here. But if you prefer to listen or watch and follow along, I'll add some extra commentary along the way. As we scroll through the blog here, I have included a few of my favorite before and after photos, just so you can see what we've done. If you're not familiar with what our Akia looked like in its before state, as well as what our Airbnb looks like in its current state. Let's start with the general process overview from Akia to Airbnb. Of course, the first step would be finding a house that you love. This could be from an Akia bank or it could be from a private sale. If you're intending to open a guest house, the first thing you'd want to do before purchasing the house is to contact the local municipality and check their short term rental requirements. Remember that short-term rentals have different requirements throughout Japan, so it's important to know before making a purchase if you can actually follow through with your goal. The next step would be to purchase the house. Foreigners can purchase and own property as a tourist or as resident. Then, of course, you'd want to renovate and furnish the house, considering what your future guests will need. Remember that furnishing a guest house is different than furnishing for yourself as you want to make sure the place is comfortable and inviting for people who are traveling. Once you've purchased the house and you're getting close to the end of your renovations, you need to meet the local municipality's fire code regulations. This could include hiring a local contractor or electrician who understands the fire code requirements. They will likely be accustomed to working with the fire department on their client's behalf. That includes coming up with a plan and submitting the paperwork. The requirements could be different in your area, but you'll need special smoke detectors in every room of the house, fire extinguishers, and light up exit signs, all of which can only be installed by a professional. You could possibly complete some additional work on your own to meet the regulations not requiring a professional. Once approved, you receive a certificate from your local fire department. The next step is to complete the Minpaku short-term rental application. This could include hiring a local judicial scrivener, who is like a junior lawyer. They understand the specific local rental laws and will work with the municipality on your behalf. Our scrivener went to Imabari City Hall in person a few times while preparing the application. Again, the requirements could be different in your area, but our application required the original hard copy of the fire department certificate be included when submitting the application, so this Minpaku process could not begin until after the fire code process was complete. If your Japanese language proficiency is high enough 
and you have the time, you could possibly complete this application on your own. Once approved, you'll receive a license number and a physical laminated license from the municipality. Once you've successfully finished those two steps, you can complete your listing on Airbnb. The first step is to create your listing title, introduction, detailed description, and photo walkthrough. Let's pop over to our Airbnb listing and take a look. All right, here you can see our listing. Our title is Benton Guesthouse, Nostalgic Showa Era X Akia. It's important to note that the listing title does have a limited number of characters, so I wish it was a little bit different, but that's what our title is. You can see that the listing features five photos at the top, and if you click on Show All Photos, one of the latest Airbnb updates is to have a walkthrough photo tour so you can group your photos based on which room of the house they're from. I also chose to include a floor plan of our house so people can see the size of the guest house as well as the layout of where the different bedrooms are. We've now earned five five-star reviews, so Airbnb has given us the status of guest favorite, and we're on our way to earning superhost status again the next quarter. If you scroll down, you can see the detailed listing information here. Click to expand and you'll see our introduction, which tells you a brief description of the house as well as where we're located in relation to other points of interest on the island. Scrolling down, you can see I wrote detailed information about each room so guests know exactly what they can expect before they arrive. I have some information about the neighborhood, our story, our restoration process, what's next, as well as what guests will have access to when they're staying here. Airbnb allows you to show all the different amenities that your space offers, again so guests have no surprises when they arrive and they know exactly what to expect. Here you can see they've highlighted the fact that we have all five star reviews and you can see all of our reviews here. Scrolling down a little further, we chose the option to include our exact street address on the listing because it's already listed on Google Maps and I'd rather have guests know exactly where they'll be rather than just a general idea of the house location. Because our location is very attractive to bicyclists traveling Japan, I chose to include some information about driving but also information about bicycling and how to use the local bus. Lastly, the listing lets you put some information about yourself as a host, how long you've been hosting, and various house rules for your property. After you've got your listing ready to go, you can input your license number and allow adequate time for Airbnb to verify the license validity. I don't know exactly how this process works behind the scenes, but it took about a week, and I'm assuming that someone from Airbnb actually contacted someone locally in Japan who could verify that the license number was actually a Japanese rental license. You'll also need to link your Japanese bank account in order to receive your hosting payments in yen and allow adequate time for Airbnb and your Japanese bank to verify the connection. Once approved, your Airbnb listing can be published and you can start welcoming guests. Another important note, since this is more of a general overview of the process, is that Japan's short-term rental requirements can differ by city and prefecture, so it's very important to make sure that you can meet the requirements for your area before purchasing your property. And since we're talking about earning an income in Japan, it's important to note that before hosting guests, you do need to make sure that you are legally allowed to earn an income in Japan. Additionally, you will need to file taxes on that income, so at the very minimum, we recommend working with a Japanese immigration lawyer and an accountant. Just a funny little story to sort of highlight the difference of how Japan works versus what some of us might be used to is we had a small speed bump when our first Airbnb payment was sent to our Japanese bank account. Remember that Japan handles names differently than a lot of us are used to. Here, last names are written first, and for foreigners with middle names, they're not allowed to be left off any important documents, nor are they allowed to be abbreviated. The example that Japanese people may be familiar with is American President John F. Kennedy, 
and they're often surprised to learn that his complete middle name is Fitzgerald. So it's understandable because of the history of their culture and how their names work that they're not familiar with how foreigners treat their middle names. So the Airbnb payment was being sent to Evan Benton, but our Japanese bank account belongs to Benton Evan Christopher. Every important Japanese document requires the full name Benton Evan Christopher. Kuristufa. All spelled out. We spent many hours with Airbnb customer service, but could not seem to find a way to add a middle name for the payout settings. Eventually, our bank was nice enough to help move things along, and I think they gave the transaction a manual override because our future payouts from Airbnb have had no problem. And a couple notes about purchasing property in Japan. Remember, foreigners can purchase and own property in Japan with or without Japanese residency. We purchased one Akia while in Japan as tourists, and our second Akia after receiving visas and residency, and the process was only different by a total of one document. We used a notarized U.S. affidavit in lieu of the Japanese Juminhyo document to prove our address. For those looking for their path toward life in Japan, it's important to remember that owning property does not grant you any form of residency. The best resource I've found by far for explaining Japanese real estate in an easy to understand format for English speakers is Cheap Houses Japan. The weekly newsletter subscription shares 20 amazing properties each week throughout Japan, and there's also an affordable ebook called How to Buy a House in Japan that outlines each step of the real estate process. But his website is also rich with helpful and free resources in the form of interviews, blog posts, and an FAQ page. When I was going through this process and trying to figure out how we could do it, if we could do it, all the ins and outs, I read through his blog post and FAQ page numerous times. It was definitely the most helpful resource I was able to find. I should point out that we do have a working relationship with Cheap Houses Japan. We're featured in his article, Renovating an Old House into an Airbnb in Japan. We also used his recommendation for our immigration lawyer and soon we'll have a referral link for his newsletter subscription. But long before any of those things, we were newsletter subscribers, and we actually found one of the two Akia that we own from browsing his page. It's a great resource ran by a friendly person. And speaking of real estate, another question that I get a lot is whether or not to hire a professional to assist with the property purchase. A real estate transaction in Japan can be completed with just a buyer and a seller, with a realtor to facilitate the process, and a judicial scrivener to file the proper paperwork with the local governing agencies. However, many foreigners buying property in Japan may not be comfortable completing the process on their own, or Japanese-speaking realtors may require foreign buyers to hire a Japanese-speaking professional to act on their behalf. We did not hire any assistance for our two property purchases, but if you do choose to hire a professional, there are a range of options. Some companies offer to complete the entire process on your behalf, while other companies offer consulting, general assistance, or just translation. Since I don't have any personal experience using any of these companies, I'm sorry that I don't have any recommendations. So please let me know if you've had a positive experience so I can share that information with others. And we're really excited to start working with our local realtor, Shimanami Property, to assist his English-speaking clients. For those of you looking to buy a home in the Shimanami Kaido area, we're working alongside Shimanami Property for his foreign buyers. Since we purchased two houses from him, we're familiar with the process and the local market. Our services include consulting, help to explain some potential real estate complications such as farmland or inheritance, and offer live video tours and photography for those interested in purchasing from outside of the country, as well as translation and communication with Nomoto-san from start to finish. We'd love to have you as a new neighbor in the Shimanami Kaido area. Let's move on to the timeline of events. The timeline below only includes important dates relating to our house purchase, renovation, and rental license up until the point of opening Benton Guesthouse. For a more thorough timeline of events, please check out my other blog, 
Japan Data Startup Visa to Business Manager Visa Complete Process and the corresponding YouTube video. On February 16th, 2023, just over one year ago, we arrived in Japan on tourist status. The next day, we traveled from Tokyo to Omishima Island. A few days later, on February 21st, we toured three potential Akiya abandoned houses to purchase, and we ended up buying two of them. Some of you may be familiar with the third house that we toured, which is right next door to one of ours, as it was a very popular one on the Cheap Houses Japan website. Most people referred to it as the barbershop. We then spent about a month off island in Imavari City, and when we got back on March 27th, we put a deposit down for our first house, which would become Benton Guest House. The next day, we immediately started cleaning with the approval of the seller prior to the final purchase. The purchase process took about six weeks, and on May 10th, we officially bought the house. Now we could begin the real renovations. I should note that the purchase process could have been a little quicker, but a few weeks of the process was spent with the seller getting the property into his name from his father's name, which they had never done, so it needed to be in his name in order for him to sell it to us. About a month later, on June 7th, we got electricity and water turned on, and that was a little bit complicated because we were tourists, so our realtor, Nomoto-san, actually helped us a little bit with the process. And just about two weeks later, we received residency status in Japan with our startup business visa. About a week later, we moved in, but it was nowhere near a livable condition. It was very much camping, without hot water and without a functioning kitchen. A few days later, we got internet installed, and this was the first time internet had been installed at this address, so it involved setting a date about 10 days out, and having a truck come out and actually run the internet line from the cable to the house. So up until this point, we had been completing some renovations on our own, and on July 3rd, the contractors that we hired began their work, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. On August 22nd, we had our first meeting with the contractor for the Minpaku rental license fire alarm requirements. He came out to the house, walked around, drew a little map, actually went down and talked to the fire department for us, and they came up with a list of requirements. When he came back to us, he had a proposal, a price, and a few things that he thought that we could do on our own, which would help save us money. A little side note that while all of this was going on, we were working to get our business manager visa and everything else. On September 15th, we officially purchased our second Akia house just around the corner. September 15th is also the day that the contractors finished their work. So then Evan and I had about six weeks to finish the rest of the renovations on our own. October 2nd, the fire department came back out for their inspection for the Minpaku rental license. And on October 20th, we received the fire department certificate. At that point, we could start the Minpaku rental license application. Now, November 1st was the original estimated date for Benton Guest House to open, but due to some things that ended up getting pushed back a little bit, so Evan and I finished our renovations on November 6th, that's what we're calling Phase 1 Complete, and on November 16th, we received our Minpaku rental license. Four days later, on November 20th, we had received our laminated license in the mail, which we could put on our front door, and Benton Guest House was open for business. We published our listing on Airbnb that day, and we got our first booking within six hours. And November 24th, Benton Guest House hosted our first guests. All right, here's what everyone really wants to hear. From Akia to Airbnb, the financial numbers. These are my numbers broken down into a few categories. The first is cost to purchase the house, total of approximately 9,000 US dollars. The house itself was listed for 1 million yen, which is approximately $7,500, and it includes purchase fees of about 1,500. That's for the realtor, judicial scrivener, property tax, and the cost of the seller transferring ownership into his name from his father's. The cost to renovate the house was a total of $19,000, and that can be broken down into two categories. 
The first is $16,500 for various contractors and professionals. Since we were working against the clock to meet the startup visa six-month requirements, we hired a local contractor to help us stay on schedule. This was very important for our deadlines. This cost, $16,500, includes the cost of materials such as a new hot water boiler and installation, new electrical breaker box, some new electrical outlets, new kitchen faucet and pipe, 25 custom-made tatami mats and installation, eight beautiful fabric screen doors refurbished, wood flooring for five rooms, wood wall paneling for two rooms, wood ceiling paneling for two rooms, paint in the kitchen and bathroom, and the traditional shikui plaster. The much smaller portion of our renovation budget is $2,500 spent on supplies and tools for our own restoration work. We did a lot of work and I'm really proud of ourselves for keeping that number so low. It really does show that when you do the work yourselves, you can really save a lot. So the $2,500 include the cost of beams and floorboards for subfloor repair, wood for various construction projects, wood and handles for the new kitchen cupboard doors, wood stain for all the exposed woodwork in every room of the house, lots of wood in these old houses, washi paper for the shoji screen doors and cubby doors, paint brushes rollers, lacquer, varnish, stainless steel polish, hydrogen peroxide and baking soda for cleaning the light fixtures, cement, tile spacers, grout, contact paper, sandpaper, screws, nails, felt pads, foam strips, gap tape, gap filler, toilet gaskets, window screen, and a couple of trips to the garbage disposal center. We bought a used miter saw with a new saw blade and router for the kitchen cupboard doors, hand tools, towel work tools, sliding screen door repair tools, drill bits, and buffer and sander tools that attach to our power drill. I should note that the tools we purchased were only the tools that we didn't already find in our garage, which was actually a treasure trove of tools and very helpful. And of course, various cleaning supplies, including gloves, rags, scrubby brushes, and cleaners for all the different surfaces, wood, tile, plastic, metal, cement, and glass. Without taking the time and effort to renovate ourselves, this $19,000 cost would have been much higher. For example, we only spent about $100 to restore the stainless steel kitchen cupboards and make new cabinet doors. That's huge. Yes, our time is valuable, but I couldn't even estimate how much expense we saved by doing so much of the work ourselves. The cost for the Minpaku rental license in our case was about $5,000. That includes just about $3,000 for the contractor to meet the fire department compliance. That's going to be different for every house because it requires the smoke detectors installed in each room of the house, whether or not they are guest spaces. And so, of course, every house is going to have a different floor plan and different requirements. And of course, we spent about $2,000 on the judicial scrivener to complete the Minpaku license application on our behalf. So you could consider saving that expense if your Japanese language proficiency is high enough to be able to do that. Now, the $19,000 that I discussed earlier was to get the house up to a livable condition but that did not include furnishing the house and actually making it comfortable. So the last category here was the cost to furnish. We spent about $5,000 on home comforts, and I've broken that down into categories for you here, which I'll just go through real quickly. For furnishings, we bought a kitchen table and chairs, office desk and chair, western style bed frame and mattress, two living room floor chairs, a bedroom chair, and entertainment center. All of that was purchased at local recycle shops, except for the Western style bed frame, which was one of the only purchases that we had to buy online. Now, traditional Japanese houses are expected to have closets full of bedding options. So we bought winter and summer blankets with blanket covers, four floor mattresses with mat covers, 10 pillows and covers, eight of the traditional Japanese soba pillows and covers, Western style bed sheets for the bed, 
and various storage containers so the bedding closets are neatly organized. All of the bedding material is one of the few things that we did not purchase from recycle shops, so almost all of the bedding was purchased new, for obvious reasons. Because of the tatami floor and the style of the Japanese house, of course we also purchased guest slippers and guest hanten house jackets to keep them comfortable. Cooking basics include cooking utensils, basic cookware, knives, chopsticks, silverware, coffee pods, tea, rice, salt, sugar, mirin, cooking sake, soy sauce, paper towels, and hand towels. None of the appliances could be saved, so we bought a stove, rice cooker, blender, fridge, coffee maker, and instant hot water boiler, all from recycle shops. For the bathroom basics, we purchased a heated toilet seat, a shower seat, shower rack, bathtub cover, and toilet brush. And of course, we had to buy toiletries like shampoo, conditioner, body soap, hand soap, various soap dispensers, and toilet paper. Of course, we want our guests to be able to wash their clothes while they're staying with us, so we purchased a washing machine, and for drying, we have a drying rack, hangers, and clips. I should note that clothes dryers are not nearly as common in Japan, and you'll often see clothes hanging on wires to dry. Because our guest house is opening in the winter, we of course had to keep the house warm, so we purchased eight kerosene and electric heaters, which heat each room individually, as well as extra snuggly blankets. And of course, cleaning supplies such as a vacuum, mop, and various cleaners, as well as other basics like extension cords, USB chargers, the kind that plug into the wall, that's just for convenience for our guests. And we had to buy some three-prong plugs for foreign electronics, because Japan typically uses the two-prong plug and a modem, as well as, of course, a Nintendo Famicom. So to save you from doing the math, that brings the total cost of purchasing an abandoned house and getting it to the point of being a comfortable guest house only $38,000. Now remember, to keep this price tag as low as possible, we spent a lot of time and energy restoring and reusing as much as we could. Between our two Akia houses, we were fortunate to find many treasures like almost all of the Showa-era home decorations, decorative hanging scrolls, framed art, display cases, a Kotatsu heating table with vintage blankets that actually functions, floor pillows, all the porcelain dishes and drinking glasses, clocks, the bathroom vanity, three freestanding wooden cupboards, stainless steel kitchen cupboards, a vintage lime green hair dryer, the beautiful antique Tansu dresser, many small tables throughout the house, three freestanding clothes racks with wooden hangers, retro metal electric fans for summertime, radio and cassette player, a flat screen CRT TV for vintage video games, and even little things like umbrellas, lamps, light bulbs. All of these we saved from the landfill by finding them in the houses, cleaning them, fixing them, and reusing them. We also received some generous gifts from our neighbors, including our cute purple couch, a wicker room divider, some large glass cases, and more Showa era decorations. When choosing what items to purchase, we prioritized used goods from recycle shops first, as well as local small businesses. Now, when you're buying local, of course you're going to be spending a little bit more, but we did as much as we could to be here and support our local economy on Omishima Island as much as possible. And so we only relied on online shopping as an absolute last resort, and it did save us a few hundred dollars on the bed frame, which we couldn't find locally except for in some of the expensive shops off the island. Now before we move on, just a few quick notes about continuing expenses. Now that the guest house is operational, there are monthly utilities of internet, water, electricity, natural gas for the stove, and kerosene gas for the instant hot water boiler that gives you hot water for the shower and kitchen, and kerosene gas for the little room heaters. Additionally, we'll have property taxes, but fortunately all of these costs in Japan are relatively low. And we are looking forward to doing some phase two renovations down the road. We've made it pretty clear so far that our guest house is what we consider phase one. It's perfectly comfortable, inviting, and ready for guests, 
But of course, there's a long list of additional things we would love to eventually make even better. These include resurfacing the bathtub and restoring the wood-fired heat aspect, beautifying the DOMA entry room floor, adding a second bathroom, which I think will become a necessity, adding a sitting and barbecue area to the side yard, installing a French drain around the outside of the house and fixing the driveway, which was a later installation to meet the road that was built at a higher elevation than the house that was originally standing there. So yes, we will be adding more to the investment over time, but that will only happen as time and budget allows. Now, all things considered, do we still view this as a wise investment? Absolutely. For us, $38,000 really is a lot of money, but when you take into consideration that we purchased a whole house and an ongoing income stream, that starts to make the investment seem much more reasonable. We're aware that houses in Japan are a depreciating asset. When you live in a country that has an estimated 10 to 12 million and increasing abandoned houses, resale value is not really something you can count on. But of course, we don't intend to sell this house. The goal is to eventually pay for itself and then to continue to generate an income. We estimate it will take only about two years to recoup our $38,000 investment. With the current exchange rate, $38,000 is equal to 5,708,930 yen. For the sake of math, let's round that up to 6 million yen. Based on our nightly rate of 20,000 yen, we anticipate earning an average of 300,000 yen a month. That would be 15 nights booked at our base rate. Seems pretty reasonable. Some stays will have additional guests increasing the nightly rate, but we're not going to factor that in for this basic math. 6 million yen divided by 300,000 is 20. Factoring in continuing monthly expenses and the slower months while gearing up to full speed, we can round 20 up to approximately 24 months. So our super rough estimate is to recoup our investment in about two years. Man, I love looking at those before and after photos. I know I keep saying this, but even though I lived through this, it's still just so hard to believe when I look at those photos that, wow, holy cow. Yeah, we actually did that, and we did that in such a short amount of time. So thanks again for tuning in. I hope this helped answer some of the more common questions. What do you think? Are you in the market for a house in Japan? Would you consider purchasing an abandoned house and bringing it back to life? Would you prefer to restore the original character of the house or update it into a more modern style? Are you looking to travel or move to the Shimanami Kaido area? You're not the only one. It seems I've got people reaching out to me every week saying that they're looking to move not only to the Shimanami Kaido area, but often to Omishima specifically, or one of the islands right next to it. So whether you're looking to come to the area to live or just to travel through, please feel free to get in touch. I'm always happy to help however I can. Don't forget to check out Benton Guest House on Airbnb and follow Benton Homestead on the various social media platforms. Here on YouTube, we are now at 88% of our goal to reach 1,000 subscribers, and we do still need quite a few more watch hours. So. If you happen to be waiting to watch some of our videos and uh, learn some of this information, please do so. Uh, the more that you like, comment, interact with the channel, and spend time watching the videos, the more it actually helps us meet our goal. So we'll keep making these videos, showing our progress with our guest house and our small farm business, and we'll also keep making these videos, answering your questions, and hoping to help you through a similar process. Thanks again for watching, and we'll talk again soon.